Welcome to the Prison Professors Program. I am Michael Santos, and I'm thrilled to be introducing you to yet another guest who unfortunately will become a guest of the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Today we're going to, speak, today we're going to be speaking with Roger Galvin. So Roger, welcome to the Prison Professors Program. Why don't you tell our viewers a little bit about your, your, your journey, your background? Good morning, Michael. Uh, thanks for having me on the podcast. Um, so... You know, my, my background is that uh, oh, about uh, seven years ago, I made a, a foolish decision to leave a, a career that I had for, uh, for 17 years, and I went into synthetic drug distribution business. What did you do before you made that decision? Before that, I worked as a manager for a wholesale distribution company. We distributed ice cream in the, the, in the Midwest, and so I, my customer base was independent mom and pop stores and schools and institutional uh, customers that bought prepackaged novelty ice cream. And how does somebody who's working in that industry and in that business find himself learning about synthetic drugs? Well, a close friend of mine had, had that I also worked with in the same distribution business had left and gone into the manufacturing of what was then called K2, you know, fake marijuana. And Strangely enough, the, the customer base overlapped with the customer base that I had been dealing with for over a decade. And that's small liquor stores, mom and pop stores, corner grocery stores, gas stations, that sort of thing. And so I kind of was, I had a relationship with a lot of the people that were beginning to distribute those products. And so you were not a drug user, is that correct? No, I was. Oh, you were a drug user? Yeah, most of my life I was a marijuana alcohol smoker. And as I did uh, get into that distribution business, I began experimenting with some of those other drugs as well. Did you have ever any experience with the criminal justice system before? Or was this, uh, in your eyes, just business as usual? No, this was new. Uh, you know, when I was a kid, I had a few scuffles and uh, a few things that happened. Nothing serious. I'm talking juvenile, you know, curfew stuff and that kind of thing. But uh, no, no, I I had uh, been a essentially a, a you know a lot of buying a lot of buying citizen other than my marijuana use and you know lived in the same home for 20 years, same job for 17 years. You know, paid taxes every year. Uh, was married. Uh, just living a normal life. So just a totally legitimate citizen, but finds an opportunity, decides to seize that opportunity. And then, uh, unfortunately, the criminal justice system came knocking. How, how did they become aware of you? I think they were aware from, from somewhere in the beginning. You know, I was involved with a, a, a group of people and, and our products became popular very quickly. Uh, and the government didn't quite know how to respond. I think we took the initiative and packaged these products in a way and sold them in a way that had never been seen before by law enforcement. So uh, after about a, a couple of years, they opened an investigation. They were following us around and they served search warrants on stores. And, you know, we, we weren't hiding. We had, uh, we had regular businesses. We filed taxes and we, we used invoices with our address on them when we delivered product. And so, you know, we made it easy for them to show up. So when you say that they were synthetic drugs, were they scheduled by the Drug Enforcement Administration? Were they scheduled drugs? No, they were not in the beginning. Um, so in the beginning, when you, when you embarked upon this, is it my understanding from what you're saying? My understanding from what you're saying is that it was not an illegal venture? You know, we all thought so. But in retrospect, I realized it really wasn't um, because these products were marked not for human consumption uh, on the packaging. And although we all knew, I knew certainly that these products are being used for people to get high with, uh, we, we denied that in our marketing. And immediately that was an FDA violation. That's mislabeling, introducing a mislabeled product into, inter, into commerce. And so, so it actually was illegal from the beginning. But uh, as time went on, they scheduled these drugs onto the schedule. Can I ask if you sought counsel when you were considering getting into this venture? Did you seek an attorney's letter of opinion or advice uh, from counsel to determine whether you had any exposure to criminal prosecution? No, I didn't at all. I was, I was too, uh, too excited and too greedy to move forward uh, okay. and, and, and do it that way. But 
uh, about nine months in, I had an opportunity to reach out and get in a, get a lawyer when some detectives knocked on my door one morning. Um, one moment before we get into the detectives knocking on your door, you mentioned the FDA. Is your case uh, a result of a FDA violation or is it a drug case? Both. Okay, so they brought two different types of uh, statutes yeah. against you. You said, the detec- you said the detectives lo- knocked on your door. Tell us about that. Well, they had, uh, they had served a search warrant on a store that was one of my customers. And the next day they showed up at my house, you know, to ask questions about these products that they'd seized. To give our audience a, an understanding of the, of the scope of your operation or the scale of your operation, how many customers did you have? You know, probably around between 50 and 75, you know, through, through the end. But, but they, they were spread out through the Midwest and uh, as far to the East Coast and even out, even out West a little bit. So, uh, but so 55, 50 to 75 customers who are regularly receiving invoices. Could you tell us a little bit about what the government may have said your um, monthly revenues were or the revenues that, that, that flowed from this operation? Well, they quickly grew, you know, from, from, you know, a few thousand a week, you know, up, up to, you know, I was involved with a, a group of people, but towards the end, it was a quarter million dollars a week or more. $250,000 a week. So it grew to a sizable uh, distribution system, which sounds like a pretty strong network in place. And then the detectives came knocking on your door and what kind of questions were they asking? Well, they wanted to know what I knew about these drugs, but you know, at that, at that time, uh, I was not willing to, to admit that what I was doing was illegal. I really uh, buried my head in the sand and I only tried to collect information that would support my, my rationalized beliefs that what I was doing was right. And, and so I didn't, I didn't talk to them, although they wanted to know about what the chemicals were, where the products came from and, you know, stuff, you know, items like that. And uh, I just called an attorney and got in contact with him right away. And did you know whether you were a, an official target of the investigation when the detectives spoke to you or were they looking to you uh, for just for information or were you a target for prosecution at that time? No, I don't believe at that time I was a target for prosecution. That was pretty early, but what, ta- what year was that? That was in, of the spring of 2011. Okay, so we're talking to Roger Gal- Galvin, who tells us that in the spring of 2011, he initially got contacted by law enforcement for his role in participation in the distribution of synthetic drugs. But now it's the end of 2017. In fact, it's Christmas Eve as we're talking, 6.15 in the morning here in California, and I think it's 8.15 where you are, Roger. Um, that's quite a bit of time that has passed since you were first notified of the potential interest of law enforcement. What transpired during those six years? Well, initially I just kept charging ahead. My greed got the best of me and my selfishness. And so it took about a year and for the government finally actually served a search warrant on our business. And that was in 2012. Uh, and then it took another two years before they indicted us. So it was, it was June of 2014 when uh, we got indicted. I got indicted, and and that's when you know I, I my path, my journey here really really began. Uh, I knew that I was in big trouble at that time, uh, and uh, the case began began it winding its way through the complicated you know U.S. courts, and it was a very large case, first of its kind in the Eastern District of Missouri, and so took all the way till. Uh, this, this last month, November of 2017, before I was finally sentenced. So that's a really interesting point for our listeners of the Prison Professors podcast, <clears throat> is that although an individual can learn that he's the target of a criminal investigation and actually face an indictment, many years could potentially pass before you cross into the sanction phase of the journey. For Roger, that was three and a half years. And I got to ask you, Roger, What has life been like while living under indictment for three and a half years? Difficult, to say the least. The first eight months, I think, were just unbearable. Uh, You know, I I really fell into a a pit of despair. Uh, Shame overcame me. 
you know, I was arrested publicly. It was in the paper. I was, you know, on, on How camera. How did that affect your other career and your family relationships and your relationships with, with other people when you were initially in the newspaper and all? You know, people were shocked, I think, and disappointed. Uh, some of my close friends knew what I was doing, but, you know, we didn't, didn't think it was going to lead to that kind of a result. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it, it, there was just a lot of shock, disbelief, um, disappointment, uh, embarrassment, and on my part, a lot of shame. And so that's, that's what I was going through uh, through the end of 2014 and, and, and 2000, most of 2015 until, um, you know, I, I, I had to get some help. I had to kind of try to climb myself out of that pit of well. And that's when I kind of came across you and Justin. So before you came across Justin and me, you, I'm sure, had a defense attorney. Tell us a little bit about your relationship with the defense attorney and how much of an investment the defense attorney made in preparing you for the challenges that you would be facing. Well, I had a good relationship with my defense attorney. Um, I hired him. He's the same person that I had contacted in 2011. I felt comfortable with him. Um, and while... I was comfortable with his interactions with the U.S. attorney and with me. He really didn't know that much about preparing to go away to prison. Um, I began to research, you know, on my own what it might be like. And, you know, as you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, things out there that can lead you astray. And, you know, the first thing that came up was, was the potential for, RDAP, an RDAP program to get some kind of time off, some kind of reduction, try to mitigate whatever this sentence was going to be. Because at that time, we believed it was going to be six or seven or eight years in, in federal prison. And what did you ultimately receive when you were sentenced? So I got sentenced to 14 months uh, of federal confinement and four months home confinement following that. Uh, as a part of a three months, a three year pro probation. Tell us a little bit about the preparations you made in anticipation of that sentencing hearing. Well, for the hearing, quite a bit of preparation. I mean, I had already been pretty well immersed in um, instruction from Justin. And well, how did, so you found Justin. Tell us, tell us your process of working with him and what value you found in that. Well, quite a bit. You know, I mean, at first he kind of just picked me up off the ground and propped me up a little bit, got my mind, mind right. And, and then, you know, told me, tried to, to lead me in the direction uh, that I needed to be in, which I was, I was facing some personal responsibility and understanding that this was my, this was my doing the result of poor decisions, but he helped educate me in that way. He helped uh, me help prepare a narrative. He helped me prepare letters to the court. Uh, he gave me a series of books to read, including uh, Earning Freedom, uh, Straight A Guide, his book on ethics, uh, which I did. Uh, they kind of became like Bibles to me. I got to your podcasts, and late at night, laying in bed, I would listen to those. And those podcasts, your Earning Freedom podcasts, really in the beginning were the thing that helped me found a base to kind of build off a belief, a little bit of self-efficacy that I can get through this if I apply some of the right things that I, that I, can, that I can do while I'm serving my time and, and not only just get through it, but potentially thrive through this and uh, prepare myself for what the rest of my life is going to be like with this kind of uh, felony over my head. You know, so, all of us would like to turn back the clock and make better decisions from the ones that, that exposed us to, to trials and tribulations in life, but none of us can do that. What we all can do is exactly what you're describing, Roger, and that's put some seeds in the ground for a, a, a new life, a new chapter in our life. And I'm really glad to hear that you found that value in working with uh, my partner, Justin, and, and our project. Uh, I have some notes from you here of some very specific steps that you're working toward as you move closer to surrendering to federal prison. Could you tell us a little bit about these goals that you intend to pursue? 
I can't. These goals are ideas uh, that have come out through your books and other people's experience, things that I've heard that other people before me have done through podcasts. And they're ideas that had been percolating around in my head for over a year. And, you know, it was time to write these goals down a couple of weeks ago because I've been sentenced. And so uh, I, you know, I was, uh, I, I reread your book on the one day in prison which I'm, I'm always pretty impressed by the level of discipline that you have. And I kind of tried to model some of my goals off the, the way that you were you know, at the end. Roger, I want to say something about that book right now because you're reminding me. I mean, I wrote that book. Roger's talking about his prison, my 8,344th day. And it was, a, I think it was at a typical day in an ongoing journey. And to give some readers, the readers a little bit of background on that book, I wrote it specifically because I was inspired by... Uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who wrote a book called A Day in the Life of, of Ivan Denisovich. And that book told the story of somebody and every decision he made from the time his eyes opened until the time he went to bed. And I thought that writing a one-day book would be a great companion to earning freedom, that earning freedom would provide the long-term perspective of how to prepare for a life in prison. And one day would talk about the importance of individual decisions. But the funny thing about going through 26 years in prison, Roger, are many of those habits remain with you. Right now, as I said, we started this interview at six o'clock in the morning, but by the six o'clock in the morning, I'd already been up working for four hours. So those same <laughs> habits that carried me through prison are continuing in my wife, much to the consternation of my wife. I know. <laughs> get up and start working at two in the morning. And you texted me at 4.30 my time. <laughs> and I yeah, I'd already had plenty of work done by then. <laughs> Michael, you're still getting up at two in the morning. What are you I doing? I am. I have, I've been out of prison for five years, but old habits die hard, and, and I'm not quite there yet. So. My wife and I laughed about that this morning. But, but yeah, but, it, but it's true. I, you know, I, I tried to model my goals you know, after some of those things that you did, and, and I understand that you know, freedom uh, can be something that's created in my mind. You know, that because my physical body is incarcerated, I don't have to think that way inside my head. But in order to do that, I'll have to do and engage in certain activities and make certain decisions while I am confined that will allow me to have a chance to feel free while I'm there. And that's what those goals are all about. And then and they really kind of align with, you know, up on the wall, I, I kind of have a list of my, my core values, which I discovered, you know, of activities that I like doing, which include reading, writing, prayer, meditation, and exercise. And, and lucky for me, those are all things that I can do while I'm confined. You can do those. There, it's never too early and it's never too late to begin sowing seeds for a better life. But the earlier somebody begins, the more uh, opportunities they can open. And, and, and I'm so glad that you found that inspiration in this type of a work, this type of work that, that, that really we have been doing as a team and I have been doing since I went into the prison system back in 1987. But I will say something about this, Roger, is you, you described a career as a sales professional before you even got involved in the criminal justice system. Is that right? That's, that's correct. And as a sales professional, I've got to assume that you went out and looked for guidance and mentoring, whether from people that you might meet in seminars or books that you might read. I know a very popular author in that space is Zig Ziglar or, you know, other people. Were there some people that were inspiring you or networking around about how to pursue best practices in sales that, that advanced you in your career? Yeah, you know, I, I think I always liked reading inspirational books and that kind of thing. And I've probably looked to sports figures, but I'm not sure that I focused in on it as much as I am now in, in my life. And, and part of that was uh, out of not out of necessity. You know, I mean, I, I was, uh, I had a pretty good marketing skill for what I was doing and developed that. Um, and, but also, don't forget, I, I was kind of immersed in another life of, of using drugs at that time. And I've been sober now for a few years. And so the focus in my life has really changed. Uh, and, and so I'm reaching out for this kind of thing a lot more now than I was then, which is that's very convenient since 
I need it more now, maybe, than I did then. Well, we all need it, Roger. I mean, the reality is, is history is replete with examples of leadership and success. Uh, Unfortunately, when people get uh, trapped into the crosshairs of the Department of Justice or the criminal justice system, sometimes they they spin out of control. and, And we all, as individuals, have to make a decision whether we are going to allow that that problem with the criminal justice system to define our lives or whether we are going to define our lives by the way that we responded to that problem. And I'm, and I'm just really, I got to tell you, there, there's this uh, story or message from servant leadership that talks about different levels of leadership. And, and one of the greatest satisfactions for, for educators is when they hear other people telling us back what they're doing and why they are doing it from the message that they learned from us. So it's a, it's a great sense of honor for me to hear what you're saying and a great sense of hope. And I, it's my hope that together by you revealing this message, Roger, we are going to be inspiring other people just as you were inspired where you, when you were uh, facing this very difficult challenge in your life a few years ago. But in addition to goals, setting goals, you took a further step, which I really admire, and it had something to do about what not to do. Can you tell us a little bit about what's on your not to do list? Yeah, I, I thought a lot about what my personal uh, characteristics are and how I behave and how I have most of my life and how those qualities may affect me when I'm confined and how those things may prevent me from accomplishing some of these goals. And so, you know, in order to kind of reinforce that, I, I knew that I had to come up with a plan, not only of what I hoped to, to accomplish and, and do in ways of behavior, but things that I would avoid, things that I knew that would be, would be traps for me, uh, activities, and also behaviors of my own. And that's where that, that came from. And the way I did it was I kind of, the way I do a lot of things now, which is reverse engineer things. It's try to figure out where do I want to be and then step down in a way that, that allows me to have a path to get there. And so I knew, you know, at the top of my, top of my uh, list there is, you know, I, I want to continue building a connection with my wife as I've been able to do through this process. That's the single most important thing to me in this world. And I knew that that would not happen if I was constantly putting expectations on her while I'm in prison and she's here at home without me running the household and dealing with all the regular pressures of life. And so that's how my list kind of started out. How will I need to behave in order to continue uh, thriving in my relationship with my wife and then follow that along with the rest of my family, the community and, and all the people that have been supporting me through this process. So one of the things that we try to do with the Prison Professors podcast is let people see a different perspective. Many people in society have uh, an abundance of information regarding the sensational of prison, about how it can lead to a recipe for failure. But with us, we like to profile people like you who have this, have adopted and embraced this strategy of visualize the best possible outcome, create a plan that'll help you get there, set priorities in place so that you know what you have to do today in order to advance new opportunities tomorrow, and then execute the plan every single day. That is the essential message that we are striving to teach. And so during these, as we move to the, to the latter minutes of this podcast interview, what I'd like to ask you now, Roger, is, What's the best possible outcome? What is it? What kind of life do you anticipate when you put your experience in the prison system behind you and embark upon this journey on supervised release in the federal system, and then hopefully working towards uh, early termination of supervised release and moving on with your life uh, with this being a part of your past? What's the best outcome for you? Well, the best outcome for me is, is coming out of this this whole process um, with a stronger connection with my wife. Um, I have a couple of small businesses that we didn't talk about. It's a couple of delivery companies that are, that work uh, in this St. Louis regional area. And how do you continue to operate those businesses while you're in prison? 
I have a couple of plans in place. And so they're very small. Uh, I have about three people that work for me and you know, my wife will help and I have a couple of other people in key places. So a lot of delegation uh, mainly and just coming up with, you know, simple ideas. Each person has a little list that I've made and how they're, what things that they're supposed to do. And, uh, and so, you know, I'll, I'll put that plan in place and hope for the best there. And so, you know, the best possible outcome for me will be able to come out of prison, have my businesses still in place, continue to work in those. But I've always been interested in writing. I've journaled a lot in my life. And I hope to be able to use that time to hone my writing a little bit and somehow uh, use, use that, um, that experience there to help other people through writing in some way. And so you don't have to wait until you get out of prison to do that. You can start writing and if and we we'd love to have we'd love to publish your writing right on the prison professors uh, website where we have guest writers from prison and one of the ways that you could especially be helpful to other individuals is as soon as you get to your prison go write, write one of the reviews so that we could learn about what you're experiencing with regard to um, your reaction to the food, to the educational programs, to the recreational programs, to the housing environment, to the type of people you're around. The more we can learn about uh, what to expect inside of various federal prisons, the more we can put our mind in place to, to recognize that, okay, I know where I'm going and I can put some, take some action steps right now that will help me get the best possible experience. I mean. There's so many people who will talk about the greatest fear is that being the fear of the unknown. And to the extent that we can shed light on what life is like in there, I think we take some first steps toward improving outcomes of the prison system. And, and we're going to count on you to do that. Can I do that, Roger? I'd love to do that. I, I uh, you know, browsed through the website, your new website, and I saw that section on there. And I clicked through as many of those reviews as I could find. And, and I understand there's a lot of places that still need to be reviewed, you know. I, I guess it's my wish that they all don't get reviewed <laughs> secretly, you know, but, 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 I, but I understand that you know, they need to be, there's nowhere to really go to find that kind of information. I've searched high and low, uh, you know, for individual prisons and, and exactly what programs each one has and what they're like. The BLP doesn't really offer that information and what information they do have seems to be outdated. And, and so, you know, Even if they do I, I, offer the information, Roger, it's always going to be more valuable to have a user experience and a user who's reporting on what he is seeing. And it's really, at the end of the day, it's not going to be one user. It's going to be the more people that you could, to, that you could inspire to write and share their stories. That's when you really move toward building a community of knowledge and a library of information that can truly scale and help more people recognize, wait a minute, I'm going into prison, but it doesn't have to disrupt my entire future. I can begin sowing seeds for a better outcome. And I think that people will find that message in your story. And we absolutely would be honored to have you uh, as, a, as a guest writer. And we'd encourage you to find others who are serving time with you to find the therapeutic value that comes from writing and recording and describing experiences. I'd love to do that. I really would love to do that. I, I you know, through this process, I, I went from, just real quick, I, I went from disbelief, shock, shame, trying to figure out, oh my God, how am I gonna survive in prison? I'm gonna lose my businesses, my wife, my home. I was in a, in a complete state of hopelessness. I went from, from there all the way through this process to where I'm getting ready to surrender and now I understand that I, I don't have to worry about a lot of that stuff. I, I can actually focus on not only surviving, but thriving through this process and coming out in a better position than I was before this whole thing started. And, you know, there's uh, unintended consequences and intended consequences from every decision. And some of the unintended consequences of me being indicted are actually positive. They're showing now, a couple of years later, to be positive things that have developed in my life. And so I expect those unintended consequences to continue coming down the road. And it's, it's, a, it's a, a very uh, hard to describe experience coming from where I was uh, a couple of years ago to the state of mind that I am now as I get ready to 
surrender. And, you know, if I can do it, I know other people can do it. And so far, my, my experience has been uh, trying to figure out how to live my life under indictment and living in the fear of what my sentence was going to be. And so now I'm going to get to, you know, get some experience through the rest of this process, which strangely enough, I'm eagerly looking forward to <laughs> rather than dreading it because it's the beginning of the next process and I'll get to move on. I can tell you that the strategies you're describing that, that we teach through our straight A guide program are ones that worked for me and empowered me through 26 years in prison. They empowered Justin through the 18 months he served for a white collar crime. They empowered Sean Hopwood, who went to, prisoner at, went to prison as an armed bank robber, but is now a professor of law at Georgetown. And they can work for anyone. So these are strategies that are not only about prison. They are human stories. They are real stories. And we're so gr grateful to have you as part of our straight A guide team, Roger. And we look forward to uh, profiling your story again in a few months when you come back home. Thank you. I look forward to it. I'd like to be here again. Good. So this is the uh, conclusion of this episode of the Prison Professor podcast. Roger, do you have any final words that you'd like to share with our audience before we uh, say Merry Christmas? I'd just like to tell everybody Merry Christmas. And, you know, I hope to be back in a, in a year or so. And I, I just want to thank you for having me on the podcast. And not only that, but, you know, for all the work that you've done, you know, without all the work that you've done over these last decades, I just don't know where I'd be. I don't, I don't see anybody else out there doing this kind of stuff. It's pretty groundbreaking and it's valuable. And I know that, you know, you've affected a lot of lives with the work that you've done. And now with this team, with Sean and Justin that you're putting together, I can see the momentum building in, in what you're doing. I'm excited about it. I'm, I'm we really look forward to having you. Maybe you'll be a prison professor with us when you come home. We'd like that very awesome. much. That's possible. <laughs> Thanks again. The more people we have, the more voices we have, the more value we can provide. And again, I just want to thank you again for being on our program. I want to wish you a successful journey. This episode will be published in mid-January, I think. But uh, I will send you a link as soon as we get it published. Thanks so much for being a part of the Prison Professors Podcast. We'll be back tomorrow with another inspiring episode. Thanks, Michael. That was great. That was great. Stand by. Hold okay. on. Let me just...